Hi, everybody. Welcome to the third lecture for Introduction to Film Analysis at the University of Iowa, Spring Semester 2020. I'm Dr. Dan, and today we will be talking about one of my very favorite subjects, transnational art cinema. So my goal here is to really give you a great answer to this question. What kinds of films are produced around the world? Because you might be thinking of a lot of different things when the phrase international cinema or foreign language cinema or foreign movies or any variations thereof is said. You might be thinking about hard-hitting films that win Oscars for dealing with serious social issues like state surveillance in communist East Germany and divorce in fundamentalist Iran. You might also be thinking about movies that win Oscars for making serious social issues like gang violence in Brazil or social inequality in South Korea into exciting, suspenseful thrillers. So putting the City of God up here because it is often called the Brazilian Goodfellas because it's taking a very, very serious subject, gang violence in Rio de Janeiro and turning it into a film that has been widely celebrated for its exuberant, exciting use of film form. It's one of those movies like Goodfellas where you can really tell that the people making the movie are in love with the medium. And the same thing is true of Parasite, the first and so far only international film to win an Oscar for Best Picture. If you've seen it, which I know quite a few of you have at this point, you know that it's dealing with social inequality. But it's taking that and making it the basis for a really exciting heist thriller that by the end of the movie has turned into something completely different. It, you might also be thinking about international films that are taking very, very popular genres like horror or the gangster film and turning them into really, really taut, just well-made genre films, like the ones we've discussed in previous lectures. Uh, if you are a fan of Japanese or Hong Kong cinema, you've probably seen one or even both of these movies. Or even if you haven't, I'm betting that some of you have heard of their more famous, arguably more famous, American remakes. The Ring from 2002 and The Departed from 2006, to date Martin Scorsese's only Best Picture winning Oscar film. You might also be thinking about something like Goodbye to Language or another experimental art film that isn't really trying to tell a story, as this one almost certainly isn't. People have said that the dog in the poster is more of a main character than any of the people in the film. But people go to these movies, these really acclaimed international films, because they want to see a really great auteur reinvent the language of cinema, which is what Godard's title is very much referring to, Goodbye to Language. Or, if you're not a Godard fan, you might be thinking of Ingmar Bergman, or Kira Kurosawa, or Francois Truffaut, or Federico Fellini, or any of these other great European art filmmakers from the 50s and 60s who collectively gave us an entire new vocabulary for making films. But let's be honest. Some of you may be thinking when you hear the words international cinema or foreign language cinema that why in the world do I have to read if I'm watching a movie? And the only thing I can really say in response to that question right now is to just point you to what Bong Joon-ho says uh, when he accepts the Golden Globes uh, earlier this year for Parasite. Once you overcome the one-inch tall barrier of subtitles, you will be introduced to so many more amazing films. And if nothing else, I want this lecture to give you an appreciation and hopefully an affection for these great variety of films that have been produced in so many amazing corners of the world. So these are all very different films with very different goals, but many of the international films 
that we'll be talking about today and that you'll be exposed to in other film classes are united by a common impulse to distance themselves from Hollywood. They, you can think of them as the anti-Hollywood cinema. And I want to say, don't make the mistake of thinking that this phrase anti-Hollywood cinema is always meaning that these movies are actively taking this fuck you attitude towards Hollywood movies. Some of them do. Some films you will see take a very confrontational attitude towards Hollywood movies and Hollywood style movies. But others are much more interested in just saying, you know what? Hollywood movies are awesome. They're fun. They're exciting. There's a reason why the formula works and has worked for a hundred years, but we just want to try our own thing. We don't want to do Hollywood. And still other films are saying, we love Hollywood or we hate Hollywood, but we only have like a fraction of their resources, a fraction of their budget, a fraction of their audience, a fraction of, uh, of access to cameras and basic filmmaking equipment. So as much as we may like or loathe Hollywood, we simply can't do that. We have to come up with something that is going to be possible within the bounds of what we can do. So when you think of these films, think anti-Hollywood cinema, but think of anti-Hollywood cinema as encompassing a whole range of ways that films and filmmaking traditions can distance themselves or deviate from or complement or critique, or 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 comment, or compliment even uh, the Hollywood movies that we've been discussing up until this point. So here are some categories that you will get some wonderful slides about going forward. Um, and this is, of course, a generalization, but based on the Stephen Crofts article that I have asked you to read, and my own sense of the field as a f- film-going person. I think it's safe to say that you can broadly group most kinds of international films into five broad categories. European model art cinemas, third cinema, quote unquote, international commercial cinemas, totalitarian cinemas, and regional cinemas. So we're going to take these uh, one by one, paying a lot of attention in particular to the first category, European model art cinema, for two reasons. One, it's by far the most influential and long-lasting of these traditions. Two, it's the one that most directly describes what you'll be seeing Anna Lily Amapur do in A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. So, European art cinema. Um, Quick note. I've put the Seventh Seal and the 400 Blows on here because they are amazing movies that are available on Canopy. So if you're really interested in seeing where this movement starts, check some of these films out. That goes for most of the films that I'll be talking about in this lecture. Most of these will be available in some way, shape, or form on Canopy, Amazon Prime, a few are not on Netflix, but there's a lot more in, like Criterion Channel has a few. So if you have access to any of these films, this is a great time to really, really soak these movies in. Seven Seal is a, a special recommendation because if you uh, were really, really digging in the news a few weeks ago, uh, you might have noticed that Max von Sydow, the actor uh, pictured on the cover, has finally left us uh, Real, real tragic loss. He was such a great actor, but he had such a storied career. You really see so many, you would really see so many great films if you just made it your mission to watch a few of the things that he's appeared in over the years. Because you would see The Seventh Seal, you would see uh, uh, an off brand James Bond film, Never Say Never Again. You would see The Force Awakens, you would see The Exorcist. You would just see so many great films if you just looked at Max von Sydow's career. So definitely check that film out. But really what I want to do for this section of the lecture, aside from promote some films that I think you should definitely check out at some point in your life, is answer a couple of basic questions. First and foremost, 
how are transnational art films, European style art films, produced and consumed? Well, traditionally speaking, these films have been produced in a nationalized film industry. So what this means is it means that whereas Hollywood films often get their funding almost exclusively from businessmen, studios, rich investors, people who expect a return on their investment, uh, a lot of the art films that are canonized in lists and documentaries and textbooks about cinema are actually being funded either fully or in part by national film boards. Now, this is very different from when the state of Georgia, for example, or the state of New York offers a tax break to uh, a film company that wants to come and film a movie there. That's a form of that's a form of government that's governments encouraging filmmakers to come and do work there, but it's different from, for example, what the BFI does, or the Irish Film Institute, the BFI is the British Film Institute, or the now defunct Moss Film, which was the state film board of the Soviet Union. These are official, nationally recognized, part of the government, institutions that exist to promote native homegrown filmmaking industries in countries that might otherwise struggle to attract the kinds of massive investment in film that you see happening in Hollywood. And surprise, surprise, when the British government or the Irish government or the Canadian government, which is the one on the bottom there, uh, or the Soviet Union in the days of communist Russia, when I've, any of these organizations gives a filmmaker money to make a film, two things happen. One, it's never nearly enough compared to what Hollywood can give. So that affects what kinds of films get made. Two, the film board kind of expects that what you're going to do is make a movie that in some way, shape, or form makes the country look good. Irish film, for example, like every film that you will ever see that comes out of the Irish film industry on some level is catering to the idea that Ireland, for all of the troubled dramas it has produced about all sorts of like turbulent periods in history. It's still a really, really pretty country, and you should go visit. The Soviet Union, when they sponsored challenging anti-communist films, like some of the ones that I'll be discussing a little later in this lecture, the goal was kind of on some level to make the Soviet Union look like it was the kind of country that really cared about artistic freedom. But at the same time, they also kind of expected that Sergei Eisenstein, for example, or uh, any one of the other directors who worked for Stalin, would not really fundamentally say anything that was going to make him look bad. And Stalin had a lot to make him look bad. If you know history, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but you weren't supposed to say that. The other thing that you need to know about where transnational and or European style art films comes from is that everybody knows that the final destination for these films, or rather the premiere destination for these films, is going to be a premiere attended not just by all of the, 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 the luminous filmmaking artists from across the world, but also government officials and representatives from various countries. This is sort of like the Olympics. Uh, think of it like the Olympics if you're a bit of a sports fan. But the idea is that everybody knows that when one of these guys gives you money to make a movie, the goal is for it to land at one of these guys so that your country has prestige your country looks good in these communal gatherings of people from across the world. I mean, this is the equivalent, having one of your films win the Palme d'Or at the 
Cannes Film Festival or, or the Golden Bear at the Berlin Film Festival or the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival is basically the equivalent of getting like five or six gold medals like at the Olympics, right? So that's that's the idea. So what happens to these movies after they land at these film festivals? Because you're probably thinking, hey, that sounds good. Countries want prestige, but how is that profitable? Well, it's profitable because after the movies play at film festivals, they go to a couple of different places. They go to a film festival. Uh, then they go to maybe a film museum, like the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, the Cinémathèque Francois at Paris, France, or my personal favorite, uh, the George Eastman Museum in Rochester, New York, where I uh, did my graduate work. Uh, these places thrive on selling memberships to people like me, let's be real, who are then like prep, basically getting like a free pass to seeing like all of these great films that are not going to play at your local mall multiplex. So that's one place that these films go after a film festival. Sometimes, though, they get bought up by boutique distributors like New Yorker Films or Miramax or Sony Pictures Classics or Magnolia and sent off to one of the range of specialty theaters. Landmark, Landmark Midtown Art Cinema was my old stomping grounds when I grew up as a teenager in Atlanta. Uh, used to go down there all the time to see like all of these great films that were being released in the, the mid-2000s. But more locally, Iowa City's film scene, which is uh, fortunately closed for the moment because of the uh, recent developments in the news. So I would encourage you to uh, buy a membership to film scene if you can spare the, uh, the change, because it'll help them out a lot right now. And when we reopen, as we inevitably will, we'll you'll get to see some really great movies, like some really great stuff that shouldn't come to a place like Iowa City because people are saying, oh, who's going to go watch this movie there, are coming to uh, Iowa City because of film scene. I am personally really excited about Kelly Reichardt's First Cow, which was hopefully will be coming very soon, or one of the first films they play when they reopen. So that's one of the other places that uh, these films go after their initial run on the festival circuit. And then the last and arguably most important place that these films go is to home video distributors like the Criterion Collection or Kino Lorber, who uh, not coincidentally distributed this week's film, A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. Um, if you are someone who shares my, my addiction to collecting Blu-rays, you may know some of the people listed at the bottom, Arrow Video, BFI, Eureka, all the films. They all put out top-notch Blu-rays. Uh, Criterion is probably the best-known purveyor of really stacked editions of transnational art films on Blu-ray. Uh, but these companies on the bottom do a really, really great job, too. So I would encourage you to check them out if uh, you get the chance. They also could use your support at this trying time. So I'm telling you all of this because you need to understand that this is the circuit of places where these films can go in order to understand some of the initially paradoxical things about international films. For example, there is a whole category of film that does really, really well abroad, wins all sorts of awards at film festivals, but is never screened in its own country. So Raise the Red Lantern. Uh, you may be surprised to know that that film doesn't play in China. That is a film that was exclusively produced for this international market. And the same thing can be said of Taste of Cherry by Abbas Kiarostami, who is uh, Anahita, another professor in our department's uh, former mentor. Uh, that's a movie where it is dealing with a subject that you cannot talk about in public in uh, fundamentalist Iran. Suicide. We, we watched a clip from this earlier in the semester, some of you may remember. 
uh, watching the scenes of the man driving around, kind of looking around at the, the world around him. So Iran does not screen this movie in Tehran or anywhere else in the country officially. But it does pay an arm and a leg to send Abbas Kiristami and his collaborators on the film, the actors who, some of the actors who appeared in it, other people who worked on it, to Cannes, the Cannes Film Festival in France, to accept the Palme d'Or, the top prize at the festival. And you would think that that would be like, well, maybe we should release this so people can see why this film won the top prize. But they didn't. So again, the Olympic metaphor, like imagine if some really incredible team of athletes wins a gold medal in a sport that we don't normally win in. And imagine if the government was like, yeah, no, they're not going to do a, do a, a, a tour. There's not going to be any parties. There's not going to be, you know, we're not going to like bring them on the talk shows where they're just, they're going to go back do their thing, and we're just never going to talk about it again. That's kind of the same thing that's happening with some of these films. But they're produced because the countries know that this is a way to promote a certain image of themselves as an accommodating a place to work for artists, as a place that respects some principles of artistic freedom. Uh, it's a way for them to show that, look, you know, you may have certain prejudices or stereotypes about our country in mind from the news or from other shows and movies, but this is who we are. We're actually just people like you. So there's a way there's there's reasons why countries are invested in making these films for this international market, but don't necessarily see any reason to release those films at home. So intended for international consumption. This is also how you get really, really really long films. So these are two that I can personally recommend. And, well, recommend's a weird word for these films. If you ever have the opportunity to see them projected, you should do it, because there is nothing comparable in your life to the experience of sitting through all seven and a half hours of Bellatar's Satan Tango. That shot in the poster on the left I mean, I wish I could convey for you the experience of sitting there for 30 minutes and watching that, because that's one of the things that this film does, is it uses the fact that there's this whole alternative circuit of like film festivals and boutique distributors to get away with really challenging one of the basic principles of conventional filmmaking, which is that it should be around two hours. This is a film that's like, why? Let's see what happens if we make it seven and a half hours. And it's a, it's a unique, unique experience. The rhythm of a long, long film like Satan Tango or like Norte, The End of History, which is a brisk four and a half hours long, uh, is utterly unique and is hard to really... It's almost like these films almost exist at a point where cinema becomes something different another medium. In some ways, closer to streaming television, especially if you're a binge watcher, you may be fact sitting for seven and a half hours watching Breaking Bad or The Sopranos or something else that's really great. Um, but it's, it's, it's different because they ask you so often to really immerse yourself in an environment rather than experience a story. So in that way, they're actually a little bit like long video games. If you're a gamer, you know that feeling I'm talking about of immer utter immersion in the world of a, of, a, of a game. Similar thing happening with these films. But it's something that can only happen because there is this whole institution of state governments and film festivals and boutique distributors and DVD salespeople who are propping up this system of cinema that otherwise would have a really, really hard time surviving because these films have never been and never will be as profitable as the things that Hollywood puts out for a variety of reasons. Both of these films lose money every time they are projected because it costs more to rent the prints or get the DCP in the case of uh, Norte, The End of History, that 
this is this is a guaranteed loss for anybody who is screening these. So the only way that survives is if you have this alternative network that is not dedicated exclusively to profit. But all of this discussion about what happens when directors decide that they want to make a really, 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 really long movie is a great segue into the next question that I want to answer about European art films. And that's how do they tell stories? Or rather, how do they tell stories differently than Hollywood films? A couple of principles that you can think about in relation to Hollywood. Open-ended narration, opaque characterization, and authorial style. So really simply, this is basically just the idea that more often than not, when you look at European art films or European-style art films, you're going to see films that are more open-ended and more ambiguous than Hollywood movies, characters who have are harder to read and harder to understand, psychologically speaking, than Hollywood heroes and villains, and you're going to see a more pronounced emphasis on an author's individual style. So let's just take these points one by one. Open-ended narration. This is the idea that stories in these films, like The 400 Blows, are often more open-ended and more episodic than Hollywood's tightly constructed three-act stories where they have clear beginnings, middles, and ends. They are way more likely to end without the neat resolutions you find in Hollywood films. I really think that there should always be a question mark at the end of every The End or Fin that you see in one of these films. Because so often what you get at the end of these movies is a sense of what now? If you've seen The 400 Blows, which it's on Canopy, check it out. If you check it out, you send me an email saying, I watched it and I liked it, I will, I will give you bonus points. That same goes for any of the other films I'm talking about. If you watch these and send me an email, you will be rewarded with bonus points, and your grade will go up, and it'll be awesome. But there should always be a, a question mark, because at the end of this film, there is this scene where the young boy, uh, the young boy who is escaping from this boarding home that his indifferent parents have put him in, because they think he's a bad kid, but he's really just misunderstood. He has escaped from the boarding home, and he runs and runs and runs. And at the end of the movie, he gets to the beach, and he just turns back to the camera, and there's a freeze frame. This, this shot here, it's a freeze frame, and he's looking right at you, and his expression is such so much one of, what now? And then the movie ends. And you're left to wonder, at least until the sequels came out, which there are actually like four sequels to this movie. Art films can have sequels, too. Bicycle Thieves is another wonderful example that some of you have already seen and that more of you will absolutely see because it's a film professor's favorite film, meaning that it is really, really one of the films that is endlessly rewatchable, and every time you see it, you notice something new. But what I want to tell you about it right now is don't go into it expecting a clear ending. Because the film starts with these characters having their bicycle stolen, which they need that bicycle because that's how they're going to make money and survive in post-war Italy. And it gets stolen, and they spend the entire film like going around uh, Rome looking for it. And they don't find it. Yeah, sorry. Don't find it. And it's a bummer. And But you know what? it's more truthful in a lot of ways to end the movie that way than with a pat. Cause any, any ending where they find the bike, that would just be really, really pat. It would seem to trivialize the kind of thing you're seeing in this image here, which is just such an evocative image for underlining like how these films like bicycle thieves, and other films in this tradition are really, really invested in showing you life, how it is, or life has how an art artist or an author or an auteur sees it. Another film that can illustrate this idea that European art films have more ambiguity and more open-endedness 
and more episodic structures than Hollywood films is Michelangelo Antonioni's film La Ventura, which is the Italian word for the adventure. So broadly, this movie focuses on three characters. And then about an hour into the movie, the middle character, who's the girlfriend of the man driving the car, Sandro, uh, she vis- disappears. She disappears. They're, they're on an island. She wanders off. They can't find her. The next hour of the movie is mostly the other two characters looking around for her, trying to figure out what happened, and then dealing with the emotional fallout from her disappearance. And spoiler alert, they never find out what happened to their missing friend. And more to the point, they kind of stop caring. The last half hour of the film is very much dedicated to their own relationship with each other as they begin to develop a romantic uh, fling kind of thing and then just as quickly lose interest in each other. And the film ends with yet another moment where these characters are just so lost in their own their own shit, for lack of a better word, that the friend who is ostensibly the point of the movie, the thing that is very much bringing them together, has has just completely slipped their minds. And again, this is this is the classic art film move to have the film end without a clear sense of resolution. It's the thing that really, for a lot of these filmmakers, most distinguishes what they are doing from what American Hollywood style films are doing. David Boardwell, the esteemed author of our textbook, puts this really, really well in another article that he wrote about art cinema, which I'd be happy to send anybody who cares to read it. Put crudely, the slogan of art cinema might be, when in doubt, read for maximum ambiguity. And this is a great segue into our next point, which is that these films often have opaque characterization psychological complexity. Characters have fewer clearly defined goals and motivations than Hollywood heroes and villains. They question their own motives or they act for inconsistent reasons. And the films are way less concerned with explaining why characters do this or that. Why does Patricia rat on Michael or Michelle at the end of Godard's Breathless? Why, does not, why doesn't she seem to care in the very famous last shot of the film? Why does Guido in Federico Fellini's Eight and a Half lose all interest in making the huge science fiction film that he's been contracted to make? Why does the priest in Bergman's Winter Light, which, by the way, it's another film featuring Max von Sydow, why does the priest in Winter Light lose his faith in the Almighty? Why does he stop caring about the re- his job, which is to, to help people in who are suffering from spiritual crises. You never get clear answers to these questions in art cinema. Because as David Bordwell says, it's not a cinema that really cares much about action. It is more concerned with reaction. It is a cinema of psychological effects in a search of their causes. Now, this can be a source of frustration for people, especially if your primary reason for going to the movies is because you want to see a good story about interesting people. But it becomes easier to get behind uh, movies where the characters are acting weird or don't really have clearly explained motives when you realize that In art cinema, your primary point of identification, like the thing that most immediately connects you to the movie, is not story or character, as is the case in Hollywood. It's it's the auteur, which is the French word for author, which is what every art film director aspires to be, the author of their films. So... Hollywood films, as I said, are driven by stories, stars, genres, and special effects. These films are driven by auteurs. And I've put up a few influential auteurs that 
you should absolutely make it your business to check out. Same rule applies. If you watch any film by any of these filmmakers and email me about it, you will get bonus points. But these are individuals who are working today, and they are renowned because they have developed a really distinctive voice in their films. And when you go to a film by Pedro Almodovar, you don't necessarily have clear-cut expectations about what the story will be or who the characters will be, but you will expect it to have a really flashy, exuberant, melodramatic, but also comic sensibility, which is very much going to be informed by Pedro Almodovar's background growing up in Franco, Spain as a gay man, which in Franco, Spain, that was that was a no-no. And his fascination for Hollywood films that he was watching as a child. If Michael Haneke is renowned for creating these worlds where bad people do bad things and you watch them as if you are their bugs under a microscope. He takes this very clinical, detached perspective on the horrific things that he shows you. And when you go to a Michael Haneke film, whether it's The White Ribbon or Amour, you don't necessarily know if he's going to be dealing with old folks in France, as he does in Amour, you don't know if he's going to be dealing with a town uh, on the eve of World War I in, in rural Germany, as he is in the White Ribbon. But you do know that he's going to make you uncomfortable. So this is the thing. When you go to an art film auteur, you're not necessarily going because you care about the characters or about the story, but you're wanting to see your favorite author like somebody who seems to be always circling around issues that mean something to you or has a style that resonates with you. That's what you're going for. Not necessarily like, like what happens, but how they show it, how they express a point of view about it. This is the reason, of course, why the Cannes Film Festival gives its top prize, the Palme d'Or, to the director, whereas in Hollywood, the tradition is to give the Oscar to the producer of the film. And this is very much the Cannes Film Festival, and other film festivals do this too, acknowledging that for them, film should be about one individual expressing a creative point of view. And we can debate all sorts of, and people have, like whether or not that's a good thing to, to view films this way, whether that's a bad thing. My own view is that you need both approaches and that the Cannes Film Festival approach of celebrating the director is a great counter to the American tradition of celebrating the individual producer, the person who figured out how to make the money go to the right places, how to get the resources in place. You need both. You need both to make a movie. Just another great quote from Boardwell that sums up this, this approach. But he's comparing Hollywood films to art films here. And he writes, in the classic detective tale, the puzzle is one of story. Who did it? How? Why? In the art film, the puzzle is one of plot. Who is telling the story? How is the story being told? Why is the story being told this way? So, art cinema. It's awesome stuff. Like I said, check it out. But even though art cinema is the most influential and longest lasting of these various broad traditions or categories of international film, it's definitely not the only one. So what I'm going to do in the rest of the lecture is walk through some other types of international films and tell you a little bit about how each of them has been produced and consumed. So go back again to the idea that these are anti-Hollywood films and be thinking about how they are positioning themselves against Hollywood in very, very different ways. So the first uh, that I want to mention is third cinema. 
So third cinema is a really specific moment in film history. The term comes from this article written by Fernando Solonas and Octavio Gettino uh, called Towards a Third Cinema, which was published in the mid-1960s. And they wrote this article, and they effectively argue that they are dissatisfied with Hollywood films, first cinema, and they are dissatisfied with the European art films that are winning those awards on the film festival circuit. Because for them, those movies don't really say anything about what they were seeing in Argentina, the political unrest in that was sweeping that country and really the entirety of Latin America in the 60s and 70s. And so here there's a photo of these students and faculty being harassed by the police in Buenos Aires in July of 66. And later this... You see, uh, this is a very familiar image to anyone who lived in Argentina during that period, but there were just coup after coup after coup, uh, one military dictator deposing another, and it just was an endless cycle of political unrest and violence. And living through this experience as young men, Fernando Solanas and Octavio Gettino were saying, like, what can Hollywood films teach us about this world? What can European style art films that are winning festival prizes and are bestowing prestige on the country that puts up the money? Like, what can this possibly say about the world we're living in right now? And so they wrote this article arguing that the movies that they wanted to make as filmmakers and the movies that they wanted other filmmakers to join them in making would junk this this comforting Hollywood style like fantasies and a tourist, very artsy fartsy European art films for movies that would promote critical consciousness at, at the very least and at the very best case scenario for them would inspire people to take action against repressive governments. So Solonis and Gettino put this principle into practice with their own films, and Solanus is still making films today, I should add. Uh, Hour of the Furnaces is the most famous one, but their work and their films and their articles inspired others to take up the call. So I've put up a still from Felipe Casal's uh, film Canoa, Shameful Memory, which is a recent Criterion release. But they were also, this article and this term was, it, it caught on. It, 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 it sticks with us today because in addition to really shaping the direction of Latin American cinema for a 10-year, 15-year period, it also was putting its finger on a push towards revolutionary cinema. Revolutionary both in the sense that these films are often representing actual revolutions but also in the sense that they tend to be way more stylistically experimental than your average Hollywood film or even, frankly, your average European art film. And like this term third cinema is coming out at the precise moment where there's a whole group of filmmakers across the world who are arguing that film can play an important role in helping people, ordinary people, achieve democracy. Battle of Algiers is really noteworthy because it is a, one of the few films that has been screened in the Pentagon. Uh, it was screened in the Pentagon in 2004 uh, for the military leaders who were in the process of planning the, as it turns out, disastrous invasion into Iraq. And they were watching the film and screening the film because they were hoping to see if it would offer hints and clues as to how to contain the very uprising and mass protests that the film depicts so memorably. So check it out. It's a great film. This term third cinema is also describing things that are happening in all parts of the world, frankly, in the 1960s and 70s. In the Philippines, with a film like Perfumed Nightmare, and the United States even has a, a small push in some segments to third cinema 
with a film like Haskell Wexler's Medium Cool, which is incredible. So it's not just Latin America, even though the term originates in a Latin American context and is most immediately associated with the films that it's directly inspiring. This is something that we care about third cinema because it has wide reach and wide applicability to a range of films from across the world. And it's left a long legacy. So you should know that the original third cinema more or less burns itself out during the 1970s because the political climate in Latin America changes, also because it's just frankly difficult to sustain a politically oppositional film movement. It just, that's, there are fewer institutions like the ones supporting European art cinema propping up these kinds of projects. But the spirit of third cinema has survived in a wide range of contexts. Art films like Adam Egoyan's Ararat and Lucretia Martel's The Headless Woman, the original film for uh, this week, which you can still access on the course's icon page. It's even found its way into certain Hollywood films. Uh, Spike Lee's Malcolm X and Oliver Stone's Nixon are two great examples of third cinema style films. Because in addition to focusing explicitly on political figures and questions of power, their form is very confrontational. Spike Lee opens Malcolm X with shots of the Rodney King beatings, which in 1992 were, were still fresh. We're not even you know six months old at that point. Oliver Stone memorably juxtaposes Nixon's 1968 uh, GOP convention speech with footage of police beating protesters to death you know, and beating them off the street and, and spraying them with firing ho- fire hoses. And so both of these films are holding on to the third cinema tradition of challenging your audience to cha- question official narratives and to not seek comfort in fantasies about how life should be, but to think critically about how life is and ideally to make changes based on that that belief and that recognition. Another type of foreign language or international film that you might be familiar with are the various international commercial cinemas. So there's two broad categories here. The first consists of films that imitate Hollywood. So here are a couple of films from England, Love Actually, the James Bond films, Downton Abbey, that England has produced in an often seemingly futile effort to compete with what Hollywood has been doing on bigger budgets and with more resources. Since the dawn of cinema. And more about why that's seemingly futile in a minute, but for now, in England, they have survived as Hollywood's biggest imitator for close to 100 years now. Other countries that have made a killing on making off-Hollywood Hollywood movies are Australia, which if you have seen any of the Mad Max films, you are undoubtedly familiar with this film, probably under its Americanized title, The Road Warrior. Because when the film came to America, everybody was worried, well, nobody really saw the first Mad Max. That was some exploitation film, like real low budget stuff. That Mel Gibson kid was cool though. And this Road Warrior, this movie's great, but we got to call it The Road Warrior because nobody saw Mad Max. But it's very much an Australian film. Uh, If you're interested in Australian exploitation films, uh, a real interesting category of movies that this country is producing in an effort to compete with Hollywood, uh, check out this documentary, Not Quite Hollywood. It's really a lot of fun. Another country that's very surprisingly has imitated Hollywood is Italy 
with its tradition of spaghetti westerns, like movies that star American actors in the leading roles, but are often being filmed exclusively in Spain or other places of Europe, and who may be casting Italian actors in minor, or actually even in some cases, like pretty major roles. So if you've seen either of these two films or are planning to see them again at some point in the future or seeing them for the first time, watch for all of the places where it's obvious that Clint Eastwood or Henry Fonda in Once Upon a Time in the West are acting with people who are obviously speaking a different language. Because you'll see Henry Fonda's lips match what he's saying. But some of the other people he talks to, like, for example, Claudia Cardinale, uh, that is all sorts of crazy stuff happening with that dubbing. But again, the thing that you see in these films that's really interesting is Italy having this uh, impulse to compete with Hollywood in the thing that Hollywood arguably has done the best, making westerns because they've had access to the deserts and the actual West, like at their doorstep. And Italy is saying, no, you have the West, sure, but we can still make a killer Western. And we bet that our our Westerns will in some ways be more popular than yours. And that's actually been the case for the diehard fans of these films would argue that the spaghetti Westerns are often a lot more fun than some of the Hollywood Westerns that are being produced around the same time. So here's the question. Why go to all of the trouble of imitating Hollywood? Like, what's the point? Like, you're, what are you doing? Well, let me tell you why. Uh, With a personal anecdote. So when I was in college, uh, this is about 10 years ago now, actually, I got to go on a two-week study abroad to Ireland. And I was really, really excited because I was going to go see some, honest to God, Irish cinema. So these are the the, the theaters that I was able to go to uh, at my time staying in Ireland. And I was so excited going to see these, going to go see a movie in an Irish movie theater. It was going to be seeing, it was, it would be like drinking water at the source, you know, drinking like Fiji water at the source or something like that. But what did I get? I got Ridley Scott's Robin Hood, starring Russell Crowe and Kate Blanchett. I really, really hope that you have not seen this film, because for me, it's the worst kind of film. A movie that is perfectly fine, but completely has, has nothing whatsoever to distinguish it from anything else I've seen. It was the big, the big May kickoff movie of 2010, and that was what was playing in Ireland in when I was there in early June 2010. And I was shocked. But then I thought about it and I realized, wait a minute, Hollywood films have such a monopoly over so many countries, like so many viewers want to watch Hollywood movies. Viewers around the world love Hollywood movies for the same reasons that we love them. They tell interesting stories and they tell them well. But what that's done is that's choked out opportunities for filmmakers in these countries to make commercial cinema, cinema that is not destined for the film festivals, that is not trying to incite revolution, but in fact, films that just want to make a buck and give you a good time. And the only way that they can compete with the kind of resources that put something like Robin Hood on their screens is by offering off Hollywood imitations, some of which are really great and rival Hollywood's films uh, in every fiber of their being, and some of which are, quite frankly, terrible. But that's why. They, They need to imitate Hollywood to compete with this. But luckily, that's not the case for every single national cinema out there that aims to entertain its audience and make a buck for the people who pay for it. Uh, The two most successful homegrown national film industries that have gotten away with 
claiming an enormous market share in their home countries. And so much so that Hollywood films have historically struggled to make as much money in these places as anywhere else around the world. Uh, India, particularly the Bombay tradition, which produces something like 500 films every year, uh, and Hong Kong. Hong Kong has produced a really vital tradition of action films and dramas and film and comedies, films in every genre being produced in a very distinct, unique style. Like David Bordwell actually has a really great article where he argues that Hong Kong action films are not like they are their own specialized vocabulary of movie making is what he basically says. These movies have been able to survive because they have they're for a number of reasons, but the most important of those reasons is that they know how to speak to the cultural sensibilities of their audiences in ways that Hollywood films cannot. And while at the same time providing the thing that we all go to the movies for, especially right now, uh, a sense of escape, a sense of, of being getting to spend two plus hours in the company of people who are more interesting than us or who are living our dreams or who can teach us about how to handle our problems, all that stuff that we go to the movies for. Um, but Bombay and Hong Kong, check them out. But of course, Hollywood hates the idea that there are homegrown filmmakers working in popular cinemas around the world, and they hate that idea because it means they can't make money. They, they, that means these people aren't working for them. So what often ends up happening in these, with these, these cinemas, both the ones that ignore Hollywood as well as the ones that imitate it, are... The people who make them get huge checks to come to the United States where they can make movies in Hollywood. So here are a couple of people who have had that happen to them. Alfred Hitchcock is arguably the most famous example of somebody who had a very successful career directing light comedies and uh, suspenseful thrillers for various British film companies. And right around the time that World War II is starting to bubble up and right before it breaks out, he brokers a deal to come to the United States, which is where he stays for the rest of his career, where he makes things like Vertigo and Psycho and North by Northwest, etc. Uh, Fritz Lang is someone else who starts in Germany with films like Metropolis and M, classics in film school, very much films in the art house tradition. Uh, but he gets to come to America and for the rest of his career is basically making like these really, really great films noir. So check those out if you get a chance. Uh, John Woo, Mira Nair, the directors respectively of The Killer and Salome Bombay start their careers in Hong Kong and have the interesting distinction of moving back and forth between making films in Hong Kong and making films in the United States. Both of these people, and Paul Verhoeven is now in this category too, frankly, uh, has an early run of films in their native countries, had a less successful, more mixed bag results of films in the United States, and who have recently returned to these filmmaking industries and other parts of the world. Because as John Woo uh, famously said, it's a lot like you don't have you don't have to go to as many meetings. You don't have to go to nine million meetings to solve one story decision. It's it's much more open and much more much more accommodating for a director just doing their thing. Wu has some really great anecdotes about how it's like, as long as you got the movie in on time and under budget, they didn't care what you did. So the director had a lot of freedom in that system. So a couple of other international cinemas that I want to touch on really quickly because they appear in the article and they're worth mentioning as counterweights to these other traditions that I'm discussing. Totalitarian cinema. Wow, what an interesting subfield of research. So these are films that are coming out 
of totalitarian regimes like Castro's Cuba, Stalin's Russia, or uh, North Korea. And the thing that is easy to do is to assume that these movies are only providing propaganda. They Now, they are absolutely providing propaganda. The purpose of these films, the reason why each of them was commissioned, was to celebrate the beneficial effects of the rule of a totalitarian leader. Uh, Unsung Heroes is one of the most famous films that nobody has ever seen because it is a long, long, long North Korean epic about how America is terrible and North Korea will destroy us. And it's really famous. It was actually another film that was screened in the Pentagon at one point because it has a star appearance from a few North uh, or North, uh, American defectors to North Korea. People who, for various reasons, decided to defect to North Korea in exchange for having a pretty comfortable lifestyle by North Korean standards. So this film was screened in the Pentagon at some point when it was... It, they discovered that these people who are technically considered in our country to be traitors and would be arrested and put on trial if they ever returned were starring in these movies. So these films are definitely intended to provide propaganda, but the two films on the left I've selected because they're a great example of how even in totalitarian cinema, you can have artistic innovation and artistic point of view kind of flourishing. Uh, Sergei Eisenstein's Ivan the Terrible is one, my, one of my very favorite films because ostensibly on the level of the script, everything that Stalin's uh, favorite stand in, Ivan the Terrible, like everything that he does makes Ivan look good in the script. And that is intended to rebound upon Joseph Stalin, the at the time dictator of Soviet Russia, because everybody watching the movie knew that Joseph Stalin thought that Ivan the Terrible was the greatest guy who ever lived. So if Ivan looks good, Stalin looks good. It's the logic driving the existence of that film. But even though the script is making Stalin slash Ivan look really good, one look at the style of the film, which you see represented on this poster, will dispel any notion that Stalin slash Ivan is a good guy. The style of the film makes him look diseased, like a monster, someone with moral sickness at his heart. And by the end of the second film, which was actually not released in Soviet Russia until after Stalin's death, so it, it, it sat on the shelf for like 15 years, that film, by the time that movie ends, like he's all hunched over, his beard is like as villainous as it could possibly be. He's like practically twirling his mustache, even though he's continuing to say all the things that Stalin was saying. I Am Cuba is a film that only got to this country in 1995 because Martin Scorsese and Francis Ford Coppola made it their mission to bring it to the United States. But they didn't do that because they particularly cared about its idyllic uh, picture of post-Castro uh, Cuba or any of the things it had to say about how terrible life in Cuba was before 1960. No, they, they and others have celebrated the film because it has some of the most beautiful cinematography of any film that you will ever watch. It is famous for doing something that Scorsese and Paul Thomas Anderson and other filmmakers would later steal, which is the long take where a camera just kind of circles around a group of characters and eventually kind of goes into a pool. Like there, the I Am Cuba is filled with that stuff. So totalitarian cinema starts as propaganda, is intended as propaganda, but sometimes even these propaganda films have something really interesting to say about how to use the medium of film. And the last category uh, that we want to talk about are regional films. And this is the weirdest category, meaning that it's the category that probably has the least reach, culturally speaking. Because a lot of these films are being produced with very, very limited budgets. 
and they're being produced less for a wide audience or even necessarily a festival audience, but are instead being produced for an artist uh, that mostly consists of, or an audience that mostly consists of the artist's community in some cases. So these two films are a great example because they are illustrating that idea in two ways. One, they're both student films. They're both films that are being produced by people who are coming out of film schools. Charles Burnett, who some of you may have seen at Film Scene this past November when he collected uh, the award that we gave him, uh, he is making this film at the end of his master's program at UCLA. Jeff Nichols is Shotgun Stories is coming out of his own graduate work in the North Carolina School of the Arts. And both of these films are being made with a very limited budget. Shotgun Stories, for example, is being made for a quarter of a million dollars, which is an insanely low figure for a film. And these films are primarily intended for small communities. For Burnett, like the immediate audience for Killer of Sheep was his thesis committee, his classmates at UCLA, the people who were from his neighborhood who appeared in the film. Like the movie was made as a celebration of their community. So it was being made for a couple of overlapping small audiences, a film school audience on the one hand, but also uh, the very community that it documents. Same thing with Jeff Nichols. I mean, the Shotgun Stories is being made for, it's, it's a movie about North Carolina for North Carolina. If you are from that part of the country, if you visited the South, it is a film that is steeped in the Southern Gothic tradition of literature and stories and it is it is hard to imagine somebody fully appreciating that film without having an awareness of southern culture or having some experience with southern culture and again the movies can get away with this because they are working on very very low budgets and that low budgetness creates problems but it also enables them to really kind of keep the movies close to home, so to speak. So again, these are you want to know about regional films and totalitarian cinema because they are an effective counterweight to Hollywood cinema on the one hand, but also these more institutionally supported and subsidized forms of art cinema. So Too Long Didn't Read. Not all art films are the same in terms of how much money they have. Some have more, some have less. How much institutional support they have from film festivals, film schools, uh, national governments. In terms of who they're addressing, are they addressing domestic audiences? Are they addressing festival audiences? And they don't all use the same storytelling strategies because all of the things I just said. Different modes of production different places they're being screened, different audiences. So, why do you need to know all of this? Well, you need to know all of this because the film that we watched this week, A Girl Walks Home, Alight, uh, Girl Walks Home Alone at Night by Anna Lily Amapur, who is pictured on the left, is a film that really doesn't neatly fit into any one of these categories. If you had to pick one, European-style art cinema is probably the one that it most closely approximates. But if you do any research into the movie's production, you'll quickly discover that you really can't call this a European-style art film for the simple reason that it's not being produced in Europe and it's not even being produced in Iran, even though it is entirely being acted in Farsi. It's being produced in Southern California by a woman who is very much of Iranian-American heritage, but has been living in the United States since she was a small kid. So I'm just going to leave you with that and save a more extended discussion of A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night for the next video. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, 
some questions for you to peruse before you watch the film and think about. Again, just as a reminder, you don't have to write about both of these. You can pick one of these questions, or you can use these as starting points for writing about something completely different. As always, we're looking for you to give us thoughts about the movie. So we're excited to hear what you think about the film, and I hope that these questions give you a few things to chew on while you are watching it for the first time, which, have fun with that. See you next time, y'all.